Well, I got some interesting things here to say again from Acts chapter 6, the first eight verses here. Last time we were talking about body ministry. Thank you, I needed that. Ah. Uh, reminds me of summer days around here. Boy. Hallelujah. Someone back in the back there. Praise God. Uh, the first eight verses here is what we were looking at last time on body ministry. We want to continue here from these same verses. I trust that, that all of you are reading ahead here, some, somewhat ahead, at least a chapter ahead. You can't ever tell how far we'll go. Because, see, I just take it, like I said before, I've, I've read Acts so many times that it's just, it's just so totally familiar to me that sometimes I might skip something that's obvious and I just assume, well, everyone knows that or I don't need to point that out. And maybe you don't know it because you haven't seen it or read it before. But if you'll kind of stay up in your reading, whatever teaching is being done, if, if there is some reading that needs to be done, if you can kind of stay up, stay abreast with the teaching that, that may be given that night, then you'll just understand things a lot better. Otherwise, like last week when we, when we read over these first eight verses, well, it's just kind of new to you. And I can't keep referring back to it without going back to it and actually reading it or you won't know what I'm talking about. So I'd appreciate it if you would read up at least a little bit. You know we don't go very far every service, so you don't have to read five chapters. You could probably read five verses and you'd be safe. Now, the next message, I don't know. We might go a whole chapter on it, but... Uh, Really, it'd be good just to have read the whole book of Acts so it's kind of uh, familiar from beginning to end. At least you'll know where we're going. And in those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. This is Gentile Greek Christians and Hebrew Christians. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. That's rare when you can find a church where you please the whole multitude there. But uh, their response pleased the whole multitude, and so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And that's as far as we'll be going tonight. Now the apostles, if you'll turn back to Exodus chapter 18 had a very good reason and a very scriptural reason for doing what they did in selecting these seven men out to wait on tables. And again, I want to bring home to you tonight the importance of body ministry, that the whole body be functioning together and that everyone in the body know the word equally well with one another and thereby, therefore, know how to minister by faith. Characteristic of Jesus' ministry throughout the Gospels is the one thing that he was led by the Holy Spirit in ministering to the people. He never used some pre-planned, programmed method with every single case that he came across. Sometimes in ministering healing, he would just speak the word. Sometimes he would lay on hands. Sometimes he would mix little mud patties and slap it on their eyes and tell them to go wash it off and be healed. So he had a variety of ways of doing what God wanted him to do just so God wouldn't be bound up in a box as far as all the people were concerned. But everyone here in the body is expected to, to know the Word, to know all the major doctrines of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. 
And see, I, there's just not any churches, friends, where you can go in and ask the members sitting back there on the very back row, will you, will you explain to me the doctrine of retribution? They'd say, retribution? What, what's retribution mean? And they'd have no idea that that's a central doctrine in Scripture. Or to get something you're more familiar with, substitution. They could not explain that doctrine scripturally to you. And, you know, they could tell you, oh, I know where John 3.16 is. But you're not asking where John 3.16 is. Or I can tell you how to get the Holy Ghost. Well, they've already got the Holy Ghost. They want to know some deeper things in the Bible. And you folks out there, it is your responsibility, not mine. Now, my responsibility is to teach you, so don't put it off on me. That is your responsibility to know the Bible that you're thinking is going to get you into heaven. You see, you believe, you know John 3.16, but do you know any else that's in the Word of God? That is your responsibility, dear friend to know the Word and to know not only your position about everything, but why that is your position. Oh, that's what Brother Ross told me. Well, Brother Ross's accounts don't make any difference when it comes down to final eternal matters. It's did God say that in His Word or did He not say it? Doesn't matter what Brother Ross or Brother Kerber said about it. Do you have any scripture for what you believe? And you see, you might run people off preaching like this because they don't want any responsibilities. They want to come and feel comfortable. But we won't let you feel comfortable here unless you enjoy the Word. And if you enjoy it, then what we'll be preaching tonight, that won't be uncomfortable to you. Well, you'll enjoy it. I never was, uh, you know, squirm back. And you look at them, and they squirm back and forth in their seat, and you can just tell that's about all they can handle. And uh, we learned this in this a recent trip. We took to another state to minister, and I, the time got away from me as it usually does. And I'd been up there an hour and 20 minutes, and we're in a Pentecostal church. And the pastor always boasts he had them out by noon every Sunday. And uh, I was supposed to preach Sunday morning, and they didn't let me preach Sunday morning. I had prepared and gone and prayed, and I walked in there, and they said, we're going to preach. So I said, all right, you go ahead and preach. And they let me on Sunday night. And uh, he holds them really short on Sunday night because, you know, people don't want to get out in the nights and go to church. And I didn't mean to go in there and just blast them away with the first message. I was going to try to hold it to around an hour, but it got an hour and 20 minutes. People back and forth in their seats like this, looking around, watches up, fidgeting back and forth. Because, you see, they've never been taught, and it's a charismatic church, that the church is a teaching center. It's not a place where you go hear exciting, exhortive, testimonial sermons. You can get that in so many other places, and you don't have to come to church to get that. But uh, in, the, in the Bible, friends, the church is a charismatic teaching center where the people are taught the Word. And nothing blesses me anymore to find Christians that know the Bible and that aren't even in the ministry. I mean, there's just nothing that blesses me anymore for them to know the Word. And I know, friends, it takes time. It took me time to learn what I know, and it's going to take you the same amount of time to learn what you need to know. But a lot of people, they know what they believe, but they don't know why they believe it, and they don't know where it is in Scripture. And that's the start. What I said to someone here the other night, the major thing is that you, first of all, learn the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And see, so you've gotten to that point. You basically, you might not know where it is in the Bible, but you know when you hear it if that's right or wrong. You know that right away because you know enough of the Word to know that, but you might can't put your finger on it. But that's what continual teaching does, building up the body, instructing, educating the body where you can put your finger on what is wrong and show that person why it's wrong. Otherwise, um, they're really not going to, I mean, it's your opinion against their opinion. You see what I'm saying? It's your opinion against their opinion. And generally, they've got a lot of scripture to back their opinion, too. But it's like Smith Wigglesworth said, I, I've just never forgotten this, that he always encouraged young ministers growing up under his ministry. He said, when you're out in those open-air meetings preaching, of course, they didn't, you know, in a church like this, they'd go out all over the country of England, stand up on a pulpit out in the middle of nowhere and start preaching to the crowds around. And he said, make sure you can quote your verses, book, chapter, and verse. He said, make sure you know where it is because people are going to call you down and say, where is that? Well, I don't know. I learned that off the tape, though. Well, what's a tape? Unless it's got the Word of God on it, what's a tape? There are a lot of tapes floating around all over the place. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that they've got the Word of God in them. And our contention still is that the, the church has failed because it has failed to instruct the body that they should minister in charismatic body ministry. That's why it's failed. 
If the church would have done this a long time ago, for many centuries now, if they would have done this, the church wouldn't be in the mess in which it finds itself to be at this present hour. Because rather than the ministry or the ministers, the pastor or the co-pastor, having all the responsibility upon them, we're going to get to all this tonight, and therefore have no time to study God's Word, all he has got is what they taught him in the seminary or the cemetery, and he's never had an opportunity to go back to the Bible himself and check it out. Why? He's too busy. They expect him to be the to coordinate all the music. He's got to be a, a building instructor. When they're putting up the new church, come out and make sure everything's being done right. He's got to run all the committees. He's head of the deacon board. He's head of the board of elders. He's watching over the Sunday school. He's got the bus ministry to take care of, the puppet ministry to take care of. He's got the Lions Club, the Rotary Club, Kiwanis, and everything else he's involved in. And, of course, you don't have any body ministry and you've got no assembly because James 2.26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead also. So a church that doesn't have the spirit of God moving in its members is a dead church. Really, it's not a church at all. It's just a religious group of people gathered together. So that's why we call it an organization rather than an organism. But back here in Exodus uh, 18, they do have a scriptural basis for what they're doing as far as they're selecting men out of the body to take care of some matters to relieve themselves so they can give themselves to the ministering of the word and prayer. And the reason I know that what I've just said will work is because if everyone in the body has the word abiding in their heart, and I mean the whole word, not bits and pieces of it, but the whole word, and they know how to minister by faith. They're not afraid to lay hands on that person with a broken leg and just pray over them right there. When you've got that in your church, then do you know what you have? You have a church full of little ministers. And when you've got a church full of ministers, well, look what you've got, a church full of ministers, and all of them are going to be overcoming this. Well, look here in Exodus 18. We'll be looking at verses 13 through 27. But uh, they just come out of come out of Egypt back in chapter 14 and, of course, Moses' song in 15. And you remember back in Exodus 3 that uh, once Moses had been, well, he wasn't cast out. He fled out of Egypt after he killed a fella. He went to the land of Midian and he met a fella named Jethro and ended up marrying his daughter. And here he's been down in Egypt delivering the people, Moses, He's come back out, and they're on their way to Mount Sinai, which they reach in chapter 19 in verse 1. And on their way, they go through the land of Midian, and uh, Moses meets his father-in-law and his, catches up with his wife and his sons again. And, well, we just better read, start reading here in verse 13. But Jethro is, what, Jethro is his father-in-law, and Jethro is watching what Moses is doing. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people, and just, we're going to relate this now back to Acts 6 and what we see in most churches today. And the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. Now his time is fairly occupied. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto even? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Well, it's because the people come unto me to inquire of God. And when they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee, for thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, 
hating covetousness, and place such over to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. So Mo Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of, of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. And they judged the people at all seasons, but the hard causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. And Moses let his father-in-law depart and he went his way into his own land. Now, if we'll look over in Matthew 17, we want to see the, another problem here in Matthew 17 of the same thing. Moses has, remember, they've not gotten now the law from Mount Sinai. And uh, he's sitting there every day from the morning until the evening taking care of three million people all by himself. And Jethro comes and said, Moses, this thing that you do is not good. He said, you're going to wear yourself away and you're going to wear all these people away too. And he advises him, as we read there, to set men over different groups of the people and let them judge any small matters. And if there was something that was too difficult for them to handle or that they didn't understand, then send those people to Moses and Moses would take care of the situation. Matthew 17, verses 14 to 21. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and off into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. See that... The man here brought his son to the, well, we can call them under-shepherds if we use the term right, the under-shepherds here, Jesus' disciple. Brought the man to him. They should have been able to handle it. They weren't. Then Jesus answered and said, and he's talking to his disciples, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Well, see, I've got a question here. It doesn't say that Jesus called on God or that Jesus used his deity in any way to get the demon out. It didn't say that he worked any magical formula that was hidden from the disciples' eyes. All it says is that he rebuked the demon. And he gave them the power over there in Luke 10. He said, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any wise hurt you, shall by any means hurt you. He didn't work anything particular here, do any miracle. He just rebuked the demon. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Now, we've got, we got a secret question to ask you, Lord. Why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, It's because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as the grain of mustard seed, ye shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. So we see they're missing two things. First of all, he said back in verse 20, and you don't want to skip down to verse 21 to the exclusion of the preceding verse, because we find in verse 20, the reason why they couldn't get the demon out was because of their unbelief. And he packs on the end there in verse 21, and he said, and it's also because you haven't been doing your fasting like you should. Well, have you Christians been fasting like you should? Well, if you run across the demon next week and you can't get him out of someone, I imagine the Lord will bring this same verse back to you. He said, it's because of your unbelief. He said, how be it? Even if you would have had belief, this kind doesn't come forth but by prayer and by fasting. But you see, Christians hadn't been taught that. I was told that fasting passed away. That was the old Jewish legalism. 
But it seems to me that we're over in the New Testament, in Matthew anyway, and it seems to me that he said that they should have been fasting if they wanted to get this demon out. So you see, the body here is failing in their responsibility. That's why Jesus called them a faithless and perverse generation. And then he said, how long shall I be with you? He said, I'm not going to be here forever. He said, you folks need to learn how to start ministering on your own because I'm not going to be here forever for you to drag people in here to me. That's exactly what he said. He said, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? He said, it's, well, it's, it's mighty wearisome to me. For you to always bring these cases to me, he said, when I've given you the authority to do it yourself. It's not that he's expecting something from them that they can't do. Because remember, he didn't use any type of magical formula. It simply says he rebuked the demon. And when we do get over into the book of Acts, we find them doing the same thing. They are rebuking demons, and demons are coming out of people. Well, they should have been able to do it back here. But see, the problem is that that the church, contrary to all the clear teaching in the Word, has tried to invest back in the, quote, ministry, all spiritual responsibility. And that is something that we're going to continue to labor because our contention is that is why the church is falling apart today. It's because men have elevated themselves up on a pedestal and people look at them as though because they are in the ministry, they, ha they have some type of unique or special tap on God that an ordinary Christian can't have. And that is the concept of so many charismatics, and that's why you see them. There's nothing wrong with respecting the ministry. We're commanded to do that. But it's another thing to think that fellow's got some tap on God that you don't have as a believer. When the Bible says that all the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Because, you see, when you look down, you can't tell if anyone's taller than anyone else. It's only when you're down on here, here on earth, then you can tell if someone's taller. But, you see, God's not down here. He's up there. When he looks down, well, everyone's flat. <laughs> he didn't see anybody that's taller than anybody else. As far as he's concerned, everybody's flat. And every believer has the same capabilities of ministering by faith that a five-fold ministry fellow has. Every believer does. And that's one message that God is restoring back to the body. And that's why we're teaching on, the, on body ministry here, because we know this is going to be something that will put this church over. When you, have a, when you have a fellowship, a body, a local assembly that is just packed full of little ministers running around. And they also have an eight-hour job working down there at the office, but they're also a little minister. And whenever they come to the body, not counting when they're away from the body, but here, whenever they come to, the come to the body, they know the Word and they're able to minister to others. And that's why God is building this core right now so that when more people do come in here, he'll have a foundation here and it won't be so taxing on myself and Brother Kerber. Because you get a church with 2,000 people in it, friends, there's no way that one or two or three men are going to take care of all those people if all of them are babies. If they're not babies, they present no problem at all. See, most of you folks, well, I'll confess all of you, don't, don't present any problem at all because you're learning the Word of God yourself. Now, don't ever think because we say things like this that, oh, if I go up there and ask him a question, then he's, gonna, he's really going to say something to me after the message. No, that's not what I mean. If you need help, if you've got a question, that's what we're here for. But before you come, I'm going to say in the message this. That is, God wants you to learn the Word yourself. And friends, there's no substitute. Most people still have the denominational mentality that they, wanted, that they want to cling hold of someone else, never want to cut those apron strings. They've always got to be tied on to somebody else because they don't trust their own interpretation of the Bible. They don't trust their own faith. And I didn't trust mine when I first got into it until I began to find out what the Word said. And then it just really didn't matter to me what other men were saying as long as I knew what I was saying was based in the Word. It didn't scare me to find a minister that had been in the ministry 30 years contradicting what I believed. It didn't shake me. But see, for most charismatics, it shakes them when they find out that someone that has been in the ministry for years and years has a different point of view about a particular subject as opposed to themselves. And that shakes them. And it should shake you because you don't know the Bible. 
But when you know what the Word teaches, then you'll be settled and grounded. And if you look over in Ephesians 4, this is exactly what we find in Ephesians 4. If it's not, if the spiritual authority or spiritual matters is not placed in the pastor's hand, then it's placed in the uh, co-pastor or assistant pastor or the deacon board or the elder board or some board or somebody rather than the people. But friends, you'll search in vain to find me any text in the Bible that talks about any religious boards in churches. The only board the Bible talks about is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're the only board a church is to have. And you'll search in vain. I know that's a religious notion, a religious idea. You have a board. In denominational churches, you've got a deacon board. You've got a board of elders. You've got some type of board. In faith churches, you have the same identical thing, and I dare you to challenge that statement. You have the same identical thing. You still have a board. But you'll search in vain to find one in Scripture, friends. You'll search in vain to find one there. Doesn't matter if it's a one-man board or a two-man board. Of course, the more you get, the more trouble you're going to have. You get a ten-man board, then you've got ten people, ten opinions, ten different ways, ten souls wanting to vote whether to obey God or not. And that's always what it boils down to. But you'll search in vain to find any religious board, friends. If you've got a board, you've got an organization. You don't have an organism. If you've got a board, you do. Because you don't have that in the body. Can you find the board? Well, I've got a board here in my body. No, because it is an organism and not an organization. And that's what God is trying to bring his people back to. They want to figure out all types of ways to get through the government and everything else, but... They're doing it on their own strength. They're doing it outside the revelation in God's Word. And uh, it's just too bad that people think otherwise. You've got what the Word of God teaches on the subject. Well, in Ephesians 4. But see, if they don't put it there, it's in the Sunday school superintendent or it's in somebody rather than in the people themselves. Ephesians 4. We won't read verses 11 to 12. You should know that. 13. Till we all come in the faith, unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Well, the same thing is said over in, in 2 Peter, if you'll look there. If you don't think men by sleight of hand and cunning craftiness will try to deceive you, then look in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. He says through covetousness and feigned words. That is, they're cloaking their words to say things that the Bible doesn't say and to mean things that the Bible doesn't mean. And it says that they'll make merchandise of the people. And that's what they do. They've gotten the people in there just to get their money, get the money out of them. they made merchandise out of God's people. But in Ephesians 4, contrary to that, we're told that the, the true ministry has been set in the body so that the body will not be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. And you just lay a little feather out, and it doesn't have to be a big breeze out there. Just lay a little feather, and the thing will just whoosh, 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 back and forth, up and down, in and out, hot and cold, on and off. 
And that's how Christians are. They're up, down, in, out, hot, cold, on and off all the time because they don't know the Word. And if you can get them to know the Word, since the Word doesn't change, they won't change. But because they don't know the Word, the Word doesn't change, but they do change back and forth, back and forth. And it's like a roller coaster, up and down and around those curves, and their head just gets spinning sometimes. And finally, they make it into the church that teaches the Word, and their head's still spinning in there, and they just cannot believe what they're hearing. And sometimes it scares them, and so they leave right away. Well, we need to admonish them, just hang in a little bit longer, and, and it'll begin to make sense to you. But, I mean, how can it make sense to you in one day when for the last 50 years you've had your head pumped full of all types of garbage? I wouldn't expect it to make any sense to you in the first day. <laughs> it did me, so maybe we do have some exceptions. When I heard it, I thought, glory to God, this is it right now. And so I just jumped in with both feet and both hands and head and all. And I haven't regretted it since then either. Uh, well, let me give you some advantages of what we're talking about, of this form of body ministry, of Moses and the way in which he selected these men to be over the people. And we've got the apostles doing the same thing here in Acts 6, selecting these seven men of an honest report full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, putting them over the people. We want to look at several advantages of doing this. The first and foremost thing is this. It frees the word ministry to have ample time for study and prayer. It frees the word ministry to have ample time for study and prayer. Friends, you do not know how much I appreciate you people here because I've been a part of other churches. I know what is going on in even the charismatic religious sphere. And the ministers are so involved with all of their programs that they have to keep the people interested. Uh, as I heard one fellow that I don't know, if, well, I guess he's back up here ministering now, that he only has time, or I don't know if he only has time, but he only studies three hours a day. I, I imagine that most of you that have an eight-hour job study more than three hours a day, and he's in the ministry. And he, he, he told another brother, you know, I can, I can get by with three hours a day. The brother had asked him, you know, how long do you study? I can get by with three hours a day. Well, I can barely read a book in three hours. How are you going to really learn anything? But you know why? It's because he's got so many programs. And they got their satellites they're trying to put way out there where God never intended for it to be. And they've got their newsletter sent out with this month's free offer. And then it says under it, four or $5 contribution. And I guess you know that's called a lie in the Bible. <laughs> where have charismatics been so long, friends? I don't know. Where have they been? I mean, is there something wrong with me? Where have charismatics been to write in their newsletter, here's a free offer right here, free offer, tape offer number 14, if you'll donate $5 to the ministry. I suppose you know enough about income taxes to know why they say that. It's because then it's not taxable. If it's, if, if it's given in that way, then it's not taxable. So that, to me, or to the Bible, is called lie and deception. But anyway, they're involved in all these things, and then they've got, you know, their radio programs, and they go on the air and... There's nothing wrong with the radio program if you're going to teach the Word, but most of, most of them, the first two minutes, you've got introduction, then for the next five, you've got introductory music, and then for the next five, you've got a little bit of sermon mixed with political ideas and religious notions and sociological occurrences in the world, and then the program closes with, friends, this is a faith ministry. <laughs> you know what's coming, don't you? When I hear that statement, I know what's coming. Friends, this is a faith ministry, but we're totally dependent upon our listeners. Well, that's a contradiction. If it's a faith ministry, it's totally dependent upon God. <laughs> oh, I just turn it off when I hear that. This is a faith ministry, and we're totally supported by those that listen to us. <laughs> my, my, my. And then they've got tape offer, book offer, album offer, picture of Jesus offer, number 14. And, you, uh, you know, people are wasting their money supporting ministries like that that, uh, you know, I get that much from Walter Cronkite on TV. I don't have to support some ministry to tell me what Walter Cronkite says on television. 
Well, I don't guess he says it too much anymore. Dan Rather, whoever's still around. <laughs> oh, glory. To me, friends, the whole, the whole thing is just so simple. I don't know where people have been. It doesn't take any theological understanding to look around and see these, these simple truths that even charismatic ministers don't realize are true and vital for today. And oh, they'll fight you tooth and nail over so many different things. But the first advantage we have here is that it frees the word ministry so that they can have ample time for the study of the word in prayer. If you look at Acts 6, we see that here. Acts 6, verses 2 and 4. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve table. And this doesn't make any sense, folks. He said this, this isn't reasonable that we should leave the word of God and serve table. Number four, or verse four, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so if you've got body ministry going, then you've got word ministry that is free so they have ample time to do what God has called them to do. And see, most ministers don't realize God has not called them to run around and knock on everybody's door and try to get them to come to church. Amen. That's what they think, but that's not God's calling. God's calling on their lives is to get into the word and to get into prayer and to stay before his face so they'll have something to say when they stand up Sunday morning. Otherwise, they've got Reader's Digest that they read the night before. And you can generally pick it out when they studied Reader's Digest or in charismatic circles, we could name such and such brother's books that they read the night before. And see, it's the same thing, friends. Where have people been? Denominational ministers, they may read Reader's Digest, but charismatic ministers, they just go read someone else's book and never get anything on their own and just come and parrot what someone else said to them. My, my, God forbid that we ever do that here, friends. Exodus, go back to Exodus 18. I have never taken anyone else's notes at any time and taught from their notes. Never. With one exception, I remember one exception when I taught down there at the school and I had to teach someone else's class for them at the last minute. And I used what they had written down to teach that class. But other than that, I have never used anyone else's notes, their books, their outlines, or anything to teach my own messages. I've gotten a lot of material from scores of people. But that's only, that only makes sense because they got their material from other people and they got their material from other people and it just takes someone that can get it all and put it together but to, as so many ministers do, to go back and get someone else's material, not add anything of their own, no comments of their own, no personality of their own, and they end up adopting the other fellow's personality. But friends, that's not Bible to do that. And ministry needs to recognize that. Well, we've got a verse for what we're saying back here in Exodus uh, 18, verses 18 through 20 saying that the, this gives the word ministers ample time to do what God has called them to do while the body does what it is called to do. Exodus 18, 18, the first part of this verse, thou wilt surely wear away. Now we're going to read the rest of it later on. But he's talking to Moses and he said, if you continue to do this, rather than delegate some of this responsibility to other people, you are going to wear away. Now skip down to verse 19. Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. So there's a, a Bible promise for a minister. You want God to be with you? Listen to what Jethro has to say. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God, and shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. You see what he's saying? He said, Moses, you go teach the people what they're supposed to be doing, and then they won't always come knocking on your door. And see, we've got Old Testament for this. And that is why we say that you'll never have to ask any questions if you'll be faithful in your attendance here and hear the Word. You'll never have to ask any questions. They'll pop up, but they'll also get answered too. 
and God will always answer those questions from the Word. If, if, if we are faithful to teach you the Word, then it's obvious that you'll get the answers to your question just as soon as whatever needs to be taught on is taught on it. But it's clear what Jethro is saying in verse 20, said, Moses, if you'll be teaching the people what you're supposed to be teaching them, then uh, they won't always be before you, and therefore it's not going to wear you away. Okay, a second advantage under that, the, the first one, it frees ministers, the word ministers, so they can have ample time for study and prayer. And there's nothing wrong with fellowship. I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but uh, too much fellowship, and then we've got no time to study. So it's not that the ministers are trying to be uh, cold-hearted or exclusive or anything else. It's just that the people, and I recognize that, I recognize when I was a part of the body, hey, if I want to learn anything, then I better give him time for him to learn it so that he can teach me that. Now, if I'm always going to be wanting to go horseback riding and hunting and fishing with him and go throw softball and football with him and have a barbecue, and that's what most ministers do. They occupy seven days a week doing that kind of stuff. Well, then how are the people ever going to expect that that poor dear soul has any time to learn things from the Word of God? We're back to common sense. That's called common sense, friends. That doesn't come by special revelation. Though to some, I think they need a little shout from heaven to boost them along. The second advantage, it allows more ministry to be accomplished. Exodus 18, 21 to 22. It allows more ministry to be accomplished. One man can only talk to one person and help them out with one problem at a time. You've got ten people that know the Word of God, they can help ten people with ten different problems all at the same time. That's what I mean. When you've got body ministry, you've got more opportunities for ministry. Your ministry just expands from then on. Exodus 18, 21, 22. It allows more ministry to be accomplished. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. Praise God for that. That so they shall bear the burden with thee. Well, there you've got body ministry summed up again. For the people to be able to get in there and have their part in ministry. Thirdly, it saves the time and the energy of those who need to be ministered to. It saves the time and the energy of those who need to be ministered to. Exodus 18, 18, and then verse 23. It saves the time and energy of those who need to be ministered to. And here's what we mean by that. You'll see from Exodus 1818 and Exodus 1823. And if you've got one man sitting on one throne judging one person at a time, hearing one cause at a time, and you've got him there from morning until evening, that means there's a whole line of people behind the first per person waiting their turn. They have wasted a whole day just trying to get to Moses and have their question answered. And you see, most pastors' calendars are so filled up in advance with all types of counseling sessions and appointments that when someone comes in with a dire need, well, I can't see you until next month, Tuesday the 13th at 4.07 and 23 seconds. And that's how they have it timed out, too. Well, what about if a dire need comes in there? Get in line. <laughs> Get in line. I got two months of calendar work to do first. So that's why I'm saying it saves the, the people that need to be ministered to. Whenever they've got a problem, they need to be ministered to right then, not next month. The problem will probably be over next month, or they would have gone on and backslid and gone to hell by next month. So it saves the time and the energy of the people that need to be ministered to. 
Exodus 18, 18, Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. See, he said, not only are you going to wear yourself away, Moses, but you're going to wear away all these people because you're having to stand here all day long. In verse 23, If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. See, instead of if there's a long line up here after the service, instead of having to waste your turn, well, you can turn around to the fellow or the, or the lady that's sitting beside you and ask them what should you do, what does the Word of God say here. This is, this is uh, I know we've ridden this horse so many times before and we're going to ride it some more tonight. That body ministry is a, a key to a church and its success when you can get the people to realize that God wants them to get in on the ministry and for them to actually feel a part of the body, that they are an important part of the body. They have a role and a function and a gift in which God wants to use them. Okay, another advantage. And this is a good one here. It diminishes, and you need to get every word down for it to make sense. It diminishes any inordinate respect that people may have for one particular individual. It diminishes any inordinate respect that people may have for one particular individual. See, I don't mind going slow here because it's a charismatic teaching center. And believe you me, once we get out of this, out of Acts, if and when we do before Jesus comes back and we get into things like systematic theology, then you better believe we're going to need to be going slow for you to get what you need to get down. So if I say something too fast, you've got a question, well, you just put your hand up and I'll answer it for you. It diminishes any inordinate respect that the people may have for one particular individual. Look over in Numbers 11. We've used this passage before. Numbers 11, verses 24 through 30. <clears throat> you have to know your chronology of the Pentateuch to understand what he's going to be saying here. Remember back in Exodus 18, they just come out of Egypt. They haven't even gotten uh, the Ten Commandments. They've not even arrived at Mount Sinai yet. They're still there on the western side of the Sinai Peninsula, on their way down to Mount Sinai, not gotten any of the law or anything. Over here by Numbers 11, they've already received all the law. They're on Mount Sinai. They've been in camp there for two years. You can see earlier, I think it's in chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. This is the first time they've moved there. They're taking off now, headed for the Promised Land. And up, you'll get over into chapter 13 and 14. They finally reach the promised land. They send the spies into the land, and of course, they come back with the evil report, and then they wander for 40 years in the wilderness. They send the spies into the land, and of course, they come back with the evil report, and then they wander for 40 years in the wilderness. So they're on their way for the first time to the promised land. And you've got another specification of some leadership here. Now, this is different than what we read back there in uh, Exodus 18. Doesn't tell us how many people here. There. Here we've got a specific number of 70 elders chosen to be over the people. And no doubt these elders were chosen out of those men that Moses first chose to listen to all the people's problems and complaints. Okay, Numbers 11:24. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. 
And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, El, Dad, and me, Dad, do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid him. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses got him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. Now you see what we're saying here is it diminishes any inordinate respect, respect. That means above measure. Any inordinate respect that the people have for one particular individual. And this is the reason many ministries fall, because they've got themselves set up so high and the people almost idolize the man that's in the ministry. He, they've got him set up so high they have an inordinate respect for him. Because, well, uh, Brother such and such, Brother Smith, Brother Jones, uh, they're in the ministry. They know how to pray for you. Go ask them. They know what the Bible says. And they're always pointing toward one or two particular individuals that maybe do have a good ministry. Maybe they do know what the Bible says. But if, if no one can minister themselves in the body and they're always pointing towards this one man or towards these two men, then, friends, it is inevitable that people begin to, to idolize those men. Whereas if you've got body ministry and someone knows that, well, I imagine that Sister Jones probably can give me the same answer that Brother Ross can give me, well, that doesn't make me look too special then, because Sister Jones knows that too. You see what I'm saying? It diminishes the... Re you're to have a respect for them, but not an inordinate respect, because then that's going to make the ministry fall if they put themselves in that position. And see, that's why some ministers purposely do not teach the Word of God, because they want to be seen as the one who knows all of the Bible. And if I share it out with everyone else, well, then they're going to know it too, and then I'm not going to be so great. Well, that's exactly right. You won't be so great anymore. But that's God's plan. And if the people around, the people that come into the fellowship, the people that observe the fellowship from the outside, realize that although there, there's one or two or three, or if you've got 15 teachers in your church or 15 prophets, although they do have that many that are in leadership, there are about 500 other people there that also know the Bible then they're not going to have an inordinate respect for that one particular individual there. And I'm just totally in favor of that. Moses said, he said, Joshua, are you envious for my sake? He said, do you think, you know, somehow this is going to hurt me, that El, Dad, and me, Dad are prophesying? That's what he means when he said, envious thou for my sake? He said, I'm not afraid of losing any prestige before the people. He said, as a matter of fact, I wish that every one of the Lord's people were prophets and that he had put his spirit on all of them. He said, I don't want, you know, he's the leader because God has called him to be the leader, but he's saying, I don't want any special prestige given to me by the people that shouldn't be given to me. He's got prestige because he's a man of God. The Bible says that the people feared Moses all the days of his life. And we looked at passages that said the very same thing when we looked over in Acts 5 and what happened to Ananias and Sapphira there. You better believe, friends, that our respect is needed for the ministry, but not an inordinate respect. Respect, but not respect to the point that you idolize them. And you see, I'm not afraid to say this because I don't want anyone to idolize me. I, my, my calling, I would be defeating my own purpose to do that. Why ministers don't, don't see that, I don't know. They defeat their own purpose to have everyone's eyes and attention focused solely on Number one, they're defeating their own purpose when they do that. But Moses wasn't afraid of sharing a little bit of the glory and the blessing of God using him with 70 other men. And then he wasn't afraid when two whippersnappers jumped in there and got part of the anointing that weren't part of the 70 that he picked out. He said, well, let them have a double portion then. He said, I could care less. So they're not doing me any harm. So God's still going to take care of me and my ministry anyway. I'm not afraid of them. And when Korah over in Numbers, what, 16, comes on the scene and tries to usurp some of that authority, and that's something different. If you come with the attitude you're going to usurp the authority of the ministry, you're liable to get swallowed by an earthquake, dear friend, 
because that's what happened to Korah and his followers. And some of them got burned with fire too. Yeah, that's another thing entirely to run into a church and you've got self-appointed apostles and self-appointed prophets that do that. They'll see a fellowship going and things are going great there and they'll try to run in and take over the show. Well, God's going to send down a lightning bolt on people that do that. But it's another thing entirely. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. That's what the Word of God says. They were swallowed up by an earthquake. And uh, what well, says the earth opened up? You don't have to call it an earthquake, I don't get.